All right, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Anthony Wodlovich. I'm currently the program director uh, at in the Department of Marital Family Therapy with Specialized Training in Art Therapy at Loyola Marymount University. And I will be going through a little bit about the program as well as introducing the faculty and some of the experiences you will have if you decide to apply and you get in, as well as the admissions requirements. Our application for the next cycle is do no, the end of November. So we'll go over those details as well. I will try, if you have any questions that are popping up during a section that I'm speaking, uh, you please put it in the chat and I'll try to do my best to acknowledge the question. Also feel free to email me after the presentation if you have a very specific question that's very specific to your application. If there are general questions you think are helpful, I'll try to save some time at the end to answer those, but I'm happy to either email you or have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom if you have more particular questions related to um, your uh, application or any other questions that you have about the program. All right. I'm going to have Maru introduce herself. Are you there? Did you come back? I just figured it out. Hi. All right. I'm so sorry. I was switching between devices. Um, I am here now. Welcome. And uh, yeah, my name is Maru Serricio Joyner, and I am a full time faculty um, in the Loyola Marymount uh, University MFT and art therapy program. Uh, I'm happy to be here and support Anthony in any way and just um, we're, you know, just be here for any other questions you might have towards the end and uh, I I'd, I'd hopefully look forward to seeing some of you at some point in the near future. All right. Thank you, Maru. And away we go. I'm going to start a little PowerPoint here to help us along. Yeah, and if while I'm doing this, Maru, if you can just look at the waiting room because I see more people coming in. Yeah, I will. I just let a few in. Completely be distracted during this. Okay. So as I as we've said multiple times, we are from, we're here at LMU. I'm in my office at LMU currently. I just got out of class early to do this. So the co-facilitator is taking care of my class. So it's a nice little break to be here with you. Um, let's get to it. We are located in the College of Communication and Fine Arts, which is a um, intentional placement. We are a marital and family therapy program, but we are entrenched in the art making process. So we are in the College of Communication and Fine Arts. This is our Dean, Brian Keith Alexander, who is a strong proponent and advocate of art therapy in our program. So with um, his support, our program is, um, we don't take in a lot of people, but we have a lot of impact in the community and in the field. So I wanted to acknowledge our Dean. I want to acknowledge, also acknowledge our founder, Helen B. Langarden, who's no longer with us but she began this program and also founded what uh, she referred to as clinical art therapy, really merging sort of the clinical process, the um, theories of talk therapy and psychotherapy with the art making experience. And sort of the basis of um, her program is the foundations that we built our program on today. Right, so for some of you, you might have already researched this and kind of understood what art therapy is, but um, this is the Art American Art Therapy Association's definition of art therapy. And also, Maru, if there's any questions in the chat you think are applicable, because it's like hard for me to look at everything at once, let me know okay. and I'll happy to answer it. them too. So art therapy is an integrative mental health and human service profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities through active art making, creative process, applied psychological theory, and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. Art therapy, facilitated by a professional art therapist, effectively supports personal and relational treatment goals, as well as community concerns. Art therapy is used to improve cognitive and sensory motor functions, foster self-esteem and self-awareness, cultivate emotional resilience, promote insight, enhance social skills, reduce and resolve conflicts and distress and advance societal and ecological change. That's a lot, um, but there's, some, there's a lot of room in the field for all sorts of work. And simply put from a nine-year-old client, art therapy is a time to, is a time to draw on what's, what's on my mind. 
So a more simplified version of that longer complex narrative. But this brings uh, up a lot of questions I get when I tell people I'm an art therapist. Oh, do you work with kids? And I'm like, actually I work with married couples. And so I think there is a, the sort of assumption that art therapists work either with younger or older populations, but art therapists, and especially in the program, you're licensed as a marital family therapist. You work with, you can work with a variety of populations and we help you work and figure out how to do that. Um, Maru, do you wanna share a little bit about the clients you see? Yeah, of course. Um, I know my my uh, clinical practice is pretty interesting too, because I've kind of gone from uh, little ones to uh, a lot of families, a lot of parent work. Um, and like Anthony, right now I see a lot of couples. Um, and I also seem to have found a, you know, not purposeful, but like I, I'm kind of specializing in um, working with older um kids right so pretty much like uh older adults who want to do work with their um, grown parents so um that's been pretty pretty uh fascinating um especially with the trans community um to help kind of the parents help the transition there so you can see how there's <clears throat> quite an array of things that um you can do as an art therapist and we'll talk more about the kind of employment opportunities as well at the end. So why, uh, what makes our program special and unique? Well, it integrates art therapy and family systems orientation informed by psychodynamic perspective. Uh, it embraces multicultural focus throughout the curriculum. It's approved by both the American Art Therapy Association and the Board of Behavioral Sciences. So the program prepares you for licensure as a marital family therapist and for registration as an art therapist. In the state of California, you can't be a primary clinician with only an art therapy registration. So this gives you a clinical license in which you can open up a private practice and be the sole sort of clinician, a diagnosing clinician. You can also work in adjunct and in supportive roles as well. Um, it is bound to California's licensing requirements. So if you're thinking of um, practicing in other states, the license is transferable, just depending on the state, how difficult that might be, and what additional coursework that might be required. Some none, some you just have to retake a licensing exam, some you just have to pay a fee. So it's really important before you um, embark on this to think about where you'd like to practice and what are the sort of restrictions of the, of the licensure. Okay, let's see. So this is our, uh, we are back now in person. Uh, our courses are in person. Um, masked and everyone who is entered the program has either proved vaccination or gotten exemption. Uh, there's free COVID testing on campus. So I know most of the faculty, I get tested once a week um, and that's available to all students and faculty. Again, if you're interested in applying, I have no idea, oops, I have no idea what the world it will look like um, when, you know, when fall comes around, but we last um, year were completely online and made that work. And I think it's really changed the face of how therapy is done. So regardless, we will be helping train individuals to do telehealth because it is really sort of like a, uh, you know, one of the sort of, uh, I think a big component of what the future of therapy is going to look like. But for now we are back in the suite. And this is what you would see as you enter in. And you will also might see some people roaming about these halls. And these are a few of them. So this is Deborah Linish. She is um, currently the department chair interim. Deborah's retiring. Deborah is one of the um, sort of foundational art therapists who's written texts on adolescents and other populations. And she, uh, again, worked with Helen. She's retiring this year, but her legacy remains. There's me, uh, program director and assistant professor. So I've been with LMU since 2008 and um, program directing. Hopefully next year, Maru will take over the program directing role. Let's see. Um, here is Dr. Luvinia Jackson, who also has written a, a book on cultural humility and art therapy. Um, it's really sort of like skyrocketing in the art therapy world right now with her research. And she will be taking over as department chair when Deborah Linish uh, retires. We have Maru, Maru who introduced um, herself who's here as a full-time clinical assistant professor. 
um, and is completing your PhD work. Do you want to name a little bit about what the topic is? Yeah, of course. Um, so my dissertation is on the workplace support for bereaved employees um, and with specifically the uh, Mexican people in Mexico. So, um, and I'm doing art uh, through that <clears throat> qualitative study. So if you have any questions on things like that too, I'm, I'm happy to answer at the end. And you can put your email in the chat. I put mine as well. Okay. Uh, we have Jessica Bianchi, um, who has an EDD from LMU as well. She's really interested in art therapy in educational settings, working with school-based children and how to infuse art therapy-informed curriculum in schools and as other interventions. She's also the director of a clinic that we have that comes from the department. We'll talk more about the clinic as well. That's where some of the students will do their practice and practicum, but it's where we're able to outreach into the community um, without uh, relying on another agency or such. And then we also have um, Dr. Um, Joyce Yip Green, who is also uh, a, an assistant professor currently and has did her PhD in international psychology. So it brings in sort of like a, a global perspective. We also have a full-time practicum coordinator, Kathleen Fogel Richmond, which is really great. So as part of your work, obviously you have to be placed as a um, as an intern working with clients. And for a lot of places, for when you're getting your MFT, you're given a list of places and you have to try to find them yourself and you're competing with everybody. We have uh, community networks that Kathleen has made where people hold spots for our students. So Kathleen is kind of a matchmaker. She talks to you about what you're interested in and she places you in, the, in a practicum. You'll still interview, you know, you got to see if it's, you know, it's a fit. If you like them, they like you. But it really cuts down a lot of the work and stress to make sure you're getting really solid clinical training. We also have two practicums and some places only have one. So we have two and we'll talk about that. Um, so you can have a kind of a shorter, get your feet wet, kind of understand the process and then a longer practicum experience. So when you leave the program, you've worked in two different settings with perhaps two different populations to really round out some of that clinical experience. And it's nice to put on your resume, especially as you're entering you know, into the workforce. Another person who's instrumental and essential here is Lori Gloyd. Uh, you might have corresponded with Lori or gotten, uh, gotten messages from Lori. Um, she's our senior administrative coordinator who sort of makes everything happen and is usually a person that will be sending emails in the interface. That is us. All right. Now, uh, we're going to just kind of go quickly through the semester. It's it, funny that we are really bad at taking pictures because the people, the students in these photos, that's actually Jessica Bianchi from back when we were in school together. So there'll be a photo of me that I'll quickly um, skip through when I get to it. But hope, you know, maybe we'll do a new photo shoot with the new, with all you, if you um, come, come here, we can uh, have <laughs> better pictures. So the first year, right now, um, we're not sure if classes will be held on Monday and Tuesday. We've been doing Monday courses um, to kind of try to keep less students uh, on campus at the time. There's usually a two or three year track Two-year track is, I think, the most common. And um, if right now, if you're in the right now, we're doing Mondays, so you'll, you'll be on class Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, at least three days a week. There's a lot of courses to take. The beginning, uh, the beginning is an art therapy studio where you're learning and interacting with the materials and kind of understanding the clinical properties of them, and you're kind of getting introduction to mental health and sort of like how it works and how it functions. Then Wednesdays, you go into art therapy literature where you learn the foundations of art therapy theory, as well as the foundations of marital family systems theory. And, and then you start thinking about child art psychotherapy. On Thursday, you have psycho, psychopathology where you learn about the DSM, where you learn about diagnoses and the different mental health disorders. You learn about psychological tests and you also start group psychotherapy because uh, the next semester, believe it or not, you're already in your first practicum. So a lot of times group facilitation is a thing that a lot of interns start to do. So we give you that. Now, if you're in the three-year track, which we'll get to later, you don't take your Thursday courses. You only take Monday, Wednesday courses um, because the Thursday courses are more gearing you for practicum. And then the three-year track, you're not, you, you only take the Monday, Wednesday, but I'll show a little graphic later. All right. We also like to incorporate a lot of experiential learning as much as possible. And one of the places that for in the child class that we've gone to is Dolores Mission School, where you get to observe children in their natural habitats. 
moving around and kind of looking at their the developmental process of art making, working with kids, kind of getting um, an understanding. We did this completely virtual last year and it was really successful in that we were able to get to more classes, um, but we typically have gone in person and sat with the kids and sort of um, gone back two times to sort of like work with and kind of get a little bit of practice working with kids and understanding again how to use art and how to like assess the art as well. So you've gotten, there I am, I'm gonna skip through that one. So we're gonna, um, so the second semester, first semester the students mostly say like, wow, this is a lot of, it feels like a lot of work because it's very course heavy. But the way that you're being assessed is not through a lot of tests and like flashcards, it's a lot of reflective writing. So students tend to be challenged more by some of the personal things that are coming up as we're talking about deep issues and spaces like things stir up in us, which is why we highly recommend being in therapy yourself. One, it's just a good thing to do. Um, one, just if you haven't before, to know what it's like on the other side. And two, I think it's very supportive um, while you're going through the program. And, but it's a lot of like kind of work um, and I think it's getting used to grad school and reading and all that, it takes a little bit of a while, but make it through. And then the, the second semester, you are on now only there two days a week because you start a practicum that's 16 hours per week. And this looks like a lot of classes, but some of them are only five week courses. So um, you're continuing with the theories of marriage and family therapy. That's kind of the, the exam you'll be taking for your licensure eventually is based on these theories. So we really want to make sure that you're getting them consistently throughout your time. So by the time you're graduated, you have a good sense of that. Um, the children have grown up so quickly and now they're adolescents. And so you're learning how to work with that range. And then the family observation course is looking at um, the different ways practitioners have worked with families. Drug and alcohol, that's going to be a, it's a shorter week class. Now the, now the adolescents are grown, they're adults, and we're continuing to, again, enforce the marriage and family therapy um, with issues and applications, which is up, support for your practicum. So this is where you get to really have a course that talks about the beginning session and like, what do you do for termination, which is just a really harsh word to say the end of um, therapy. Um, termination, I don't know why that sounds really harsh. Um, and then we're start, and then what, another component of our, our, our program is really research. It's a young field. And so publishing is such a possibility and there's so much to contribute. If you're interested in any research, this is a really exciting uh, field to be in because it's still growing. Um, so we kind of talk a little bit about research. Uh, it's again, another five week course. So even though there's a lot of classes, some of them like intro to research and drugs and alcohol, they're not, they're not the full time but you will be in a practicum 16 hours a week. And again, being placed by Kathleen. But before we get to practicum, one of the places that uh, we've gone to in adolescent psychotherapy is juvenile hall, working with incarcerated adolescents in the juvenile justice system. And what I love about these experientials and the practicums is that you're sort of challenged to work with different populations. Some people come in very clear, like I can't work with kids, I can't work with this population, I can't. But I think sometimes we discover a joy and like a passion of working with certain in certain spaces or, or people and getting the exposure really helps us understand our own biases and test our own kind of limitations. But again, you'll work with Kathleen. Um, so there was a lot of anxiety about going to juvenile hall the first time we did it, that Deborah, who was teaching the class did a little survey and wanted to see how um, people felt about it. And so you can see here a little bell graph of people who were somewhat apprehensive and apprehensive and very apprehensive about going to juvenile hall. So there's a lot of anxiety. People who weren't familiar with the juvenile justice system had watched a lot of TV about what they thought it was going to be like to work with someone uh, in juvenile hall. But then after, you can see that there was not there was no apprehension going back for the majority of individuals and so it's sort of like i think the joy of the program is kind of there's a, really challenging our own biases assumptions and beliefs and working through that so i think the program isn't just a great way to learn skills it's a great way to learn about yourself i kind of felt like i went to art school and like a deep intensive retreat and uh, like marital family therapy program and an art therapy program that was very um it was very extensive so let me see. Okay, first practicum. So it's 15 weeks. So it's only like the second, uh, the second semester. Our weeks are, um, our semesters are about 15, are 15 weeks, 16 hours a week, and you get to work with the practicum of when that time will be. 
and it tends to be short-term treatment models. So you're not seeing clients for, you know, very, uh, usually not very long. So sometimes it's like, you know, maybe um, some groups, substance abuse centers where people have to check in if they're getting treatment or getting methadone. And you'll have a on-site MFT supervisor who's going to help you on-site. And you also have an off-site art therapy supervisor. So you're going to have two sets of supervision to help support you through this time. And we have a little video that I hope will share and air um, about the practicum. Let's see if this just magically works. Practice the clinical learning okay. that students are getting in the classroom. So they go out into the field and they work with actual clients, providing art therapy to benefit the clients as well as to allow them to learn really how to do this work. What's really unique about the practicum training at LMU is that we have long standing relationships with many agencies throughout Southern California. Additionally, our students are placed directly into their agencies and do not have to go out into the community to try to find their own placements. And the agencies and the students really benefit from this partnership. The agency I worked at is the Children's Hospital of LA in the Expressive Arts and Therapies Department where we have art therapy, dance therapy, and music therapy. I was placed at Department of State Hospitals Metropolitan. Um, it's a psychiatric hospital and um, I was working with people who were under conservatorship, uh, meaning they were deemed gravely disabled due to their mental illness uh, and were under uh, the care of a public guardian. In my first year, I was at a practicum called Exodus Recovery. It was an inpatient short-term residential facility for adults suffering from mental illness. The agency that I worked at was the Hound Bee Land Garden Art Therapy Clinic here at LMU, and I worked at Dolores Mission School in Boyle Heights. The types of clinical experiences our students would get training in are wide-ranging, everything from hospitals to residential treatment centers to outpatient clinics and therapeutic schools. While at LMU, students are gaining hours towards registration as an art therapist with the Art Therapy Credentialing Board at the same time that they're pursuing licensure in the state of California as a marriage and family therapist. At LMU, our program is designed to be fully integrated so that at the same time they're learning the theories of marriage and family therapy, they're also learning how to do art therapy intervention. So an image I did in practicum that reflects how I felt about practicum was based on my art therapy supervisor's recommendation to do art in response to how I worked with my clients and how I saw myself helping them, and I actually used uh, a lot of materials from the hospital, so hospital gloves, band-aids, and so forth, to make a response piece of working with one of my clients. What I learned most about art therapy and practicum uh, was that sometimes um, just witnessing is enough. Um, I think art is a great vehicle for that uh, because it really allows a, a very special sort of interaction and space between therapist and client. Um, so to just be a, just a witness of someone um, through their creative process, through the process of them um, externalizing something that's so personal and internal, um, I think that that was a really great piece for me to learn of what art can do. What I learned the most during practicum was flexibility. Since the population I was with, there was a lot of mental illness. I learned flexibility in tailoring the art therapy directives to the clients. What I learned the most about art therapy in my practicum was that it's an incredible tool to be able to connect to the children in a way that verbal communication um, would not allow. All right, and they were not paid spokespeople. Those are actual students. All right, so one of the things I think is very helpful about, um, we'll get to the summer in a moment, what the reiterating again that some art therapy programs have an art therapy course and uh, maybe a marital family therapy course. So you're taking art therapy classes and you're taking like marital family therapy classes. Uh, it's all integrated. We don't, we're talking about art in all the classes and how to use it. So it's not, just a couple of courses you take, which is really why sometimes when people want to come who already have a license and say, oh, can I just take some of your art therapy classes? But like, it's all of them. So you get a really comprehensive understanding of how to use metaphor and art to facilitate um, the therapeutic process. All right. It is a 60 unit program. And so there is a lot of, um, there's a lot to do. 
And we want to make sure that all these courses, they're all required for your registration or licensure. And because of that, we do have a summer session that you have to take. Um, these are three courses you take that are hybrid online and in person. They're um, for part of the, there's two summer sessions. You still have a pretty big break because our um, summer begins in May, like May 5th. And then we come back to school the end of August. So you have like May, June, July, and August off. So these courses are kind of done by the end of May. Um, maybe a little into June, and then you have the rest of the time as well. But again, you're not, they're, they're less intensive, they're shorter classes, and a lot of them are online components. So it's psychopharmacology, you, to, we were not prescribing medications, but it's really important to understand the medications that are prescribed and their effects and how we can understand and work with clients with their meds. Aging and long-term care and trauma art therapy. Um, the word trauma is used kind of colloquially a lot about, you know, anything negative that impacts us, but we really try to make an effort of understanding trauma and how it affects our bodies and the work So having a course dedicated to that. There's an international program that is an optional part of the summer that usually begins in July. Um, so you still have some time, a little, still, still break time. But what we're doing is we're redeveloping this because we used to go San Miguel de Allende. And um, now we're kind of expanding that to uh, thinking about other places and spaces. Right now we're doing a virtual, we've done a virtual sort of um, course and, and services with um, students from Mexico and, and Israel and kind of coming together. And I know Maru, you've been part of this sort of like revamping process. And we're really excited about the potential. The pandemic and the shutting down really sort of like limited a lot of our options, but we saw it as a way to expand. And we're working on, we think there's a lot of Im import in really going to a place and being there physically to work with populations and people. But also, can we also uh, do that in addition to doing more virtual spaces to be able to connect to more art therapists internationally and around, around the world? So we are really used a lot of this pandemic as an opportunity to really reassess and grow our program. Again, because it's still, we're not sure what will be possible next summer. We're not sure um, what, will, what will be in person, what will be in virtual. But let's hope we can travel someplace and be with people. And this is an optional part of the program, so it's not required, but it is something that I think is a real benefit. Okay, now you still have a little bit of summer to relax unwind your practicum stops when your school stops so you don't continue practicum usually if you're in a school based sometimes they ask if you want to stay a little bit and it just benefits you to get more hours but the practicums are sort of connected to our semesters um okay next in your second year you're only on class on tuesdays and that's where i had to I'll leave the cultural issues in marital family therapy course and so, because you're really doing most of your clinical training in your practicum now 20 hours a week. And this practicum is gonna extend for the whole year. And you're on here um, learning, again, reiterating those merit and family therapy um, theories. And you're also now going into research methodology because in your second year, you're focusing on your practicum and a research project. The research project is usually head by, headed by a faculty member and you work in teams to help complete a, a project. If you would like to do an independent project, there's an ability to fill out a form and get permission to have a faculty sponsor. But we found that a lot of research, good research is done with teamwork and really to be able to enhance the quality of the work, working together in teams, thinking about what your strengths are as researchers. And some of the, um, some of the research projects involve clinical work. Right now, I'm looking really at contemporary art and its intersection with art therapy as the research cluster that I'm overseeing this year. So depending on if you identify, how you identify as a researcher, as an artist, as more of a clinician, there's opportunities for you to really explore and research and delve into that area. All research projects will result in a, um, a thesis, but they also resulted in art exhibitions and other ways of um, presenting the work. So we wanna think about research as just another form of expression and creativity. Art, we believe, is a way of knowing, not just a way of showing something. So art is a way of reflecting and understanding ourselves and our cl clients. And research is just about looking at, in, looking at things again to research for meaning. So we think of it as just kind of an extension of an art process that we're investigating something and we are walk you through um, the way to do that. So that way you can be prepared if you wanted to after this program to continue to do research 
And we'll talk about our sort of uh, connection to our alumni and how we continue to offer support for research after you graduate. Um, the practicum, the second practicum again is 30 weeks because it's the full year and it's 20 hours per week. And your longer term treatment and you still have an on-site MFT supervisor and an art therapy supervisor. But the first, uh, in the first practicum, you're more in group supervision and now you have more one-on-one -on -one supervision. So you have a little bit more um, support. And this is kind of where you get to really see the extent of the clinical process. These are just some of the places and spaces where we have partnerships and there are always new partnerships coming up. So we have worked with uh, individuals who lived in San Diego or places kind of far to try to find spaces where we can create connections. So Kathleen really not only works with what your what works for you as, as far as your education and your clinical training, but also understanding that sometimes it's about your time and your location and your imbalancing things and your, your life needs. So this is an ever growing network of clinical training sites that we have. All right, what have we done? Okay, now you're getting we're almost getting ready to graduate here. So, so again, you're on class on Tuesdays and we're continuing your research paper and you're having a sort of sh uh, shorter courses on intimate partner violence and human sexuality. And then we end with ethics and we talk about ethics the entire time, but you, you will be required to take an ethics exam upon graduating. So that's kind of the first exam you'll take. So we wanted to like make sure that you're prepared for it by having it one of the final things we kind of go over. It's not like you're not ethical the entire time. We definitely talk about the ethics and the standards that are required, but this is a time to really sit with it. Now that you've had a breath of clinical practice, because there's one thing about thinking about how to work in space theoretically than it is about like actually having that lived experience and kind of seeing how like, oh, some of the situations that, yeah, you know, how do we sit with them? You're continuing on your and you're continuing on in your practicum so what this is just a little model of what it is like to be in the three-year program so simply put the three-year program just takes the first year and divides it into two so you take all the thursday classes in the second year so you're just taking the two uh two days a week the first year and then the second year you're taking the thursday courses and you're starting your practicum in the second um, semester of your second year which would be the fourth semester. And the, but the last year looks the same. So we, we would call it part-time, but it's kind of misleading because you're sort of part-time the first two years and then you're kind of full-time the last year because you need to be in practicum that many hours to meet licensure expectations. And so you're gonna be in class all, on Tuesdays and you're gonna have that. So just paying attention to um, that, it can be a, sh a different shift in pace for individuals who are on the three-year track. If you're on the three-year track, you also end with another cohort. So we you started with a cohort of like 20 to 24. So we only admit 20 to 24 individuals and you kind of carry through and you take all the classes in the same order with the same people, which could be loving, lovely, loving, could be loving and lovely. Um, but if you are in the um, three-year track, you actually stay with the, the individuals that are in the three-year track will start with one cohort. And then the second year they meet the other cohort and graduate with them because you're taking those Thursday classes. So for some people, they like that. They're like, oh my God, two different groups of people, networks. Um, others felt like, oh, I kind of won't, wanted to bond with one group. So there's all considerations when determining whether you wanna do the three-year or two-year. It also, again, has financial implications because you're paying for the units you're taking. And also if you have a, a job or childcare issues, sometimes there's more flexibility, again, at least in the first two years. All right. So um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the other amazing things we have here. So we have a clinic that was founded by Helen B. Langarden. This door actually leads to the library, um, not to the clinic, because the clinic doesn't really exist as a space. Uh, we go to where we're needed. So we meet in the, the, meet in the suite and, um, and sometimes services are done here. But for the most part, um, the clinic wants to go where they're needed. So they go into schools and other institutions that ask for some services. So some of the services we've provided before has been the Thomas Riley Group for Pregnant and Parenting Teens. They actually did come on campus. Um, the Resilient and Ready, which are structured therapy groups to build resiliency, and those are done in schools. We've gone to different places to do family art assessment. I'm sorry, I'm just like <laughs> clicking, trying to click you. I'm clicking to see you and I'm clicking the screen, so I'm clicking all over the place. Um, and so a lot of times our practicums, our, our students do their practicums in the clinic. 
which is, was really, really helpful during the pandemic because we had our own clinic. And as opposed to other agencies which were not taking students or had limited hours or were trying to restructure, we were able to actually create enough hours for our students to be able to be on track, um, even when things were moving from um, in person to remote. So it gives a lot of opportunities for great clinical training um, and also opportunity to sort of build because a lot of times some of these um, programming have actually come from students who are in the pro program saying, you know, it'd be really great if we could do this. So, and, and on post-graduation, there's, there's been two positions you can actually hold as paid positions as a research or a clinical fellowship. Um, some of our students have come back to help and continue to work in the, in the uh, clinic. Another thing that we have is an art therapy research institute, and we also publish our own journal, peer-reviewed journal, called the Journal of Clinical Art Therapy. And this institute um, invites visiting scholars and has faculty talks. We have a annual research symposium where we delve into a topic. There's also the Art Therapy Alumni Research Collective, which is for alumni who are interested in research meeting together um, like once a month to really talk about and help support each other in research. And oftentimes like those, that research can get supported by the faculty um, if they're interested. So there's a lot of work we try to do with our alumni to keep them connected and help support them in the field. That's true with like job postings. Some people tell us, please stop posting these jobs. I have one, um, but we um, are constantly getting people that are coming to us first saying, before we post this, can you send it to our students? Because they have a lot of trust in the clinical training. So we like really try to make sure that we're always connected to our alumni um, and continue to support them and know what they're doing and create new partnerships as well. Okay, so now, how do you get in? You ask, maybe. I haven't checked the chat. So Madhu, if there's anything in the chat right now that you think would be helpful for me to answer, I'll be happy to. Yes, actually, I was trying to find a link. Um, <clears throat> so there was a question. I mean, I have to answer a few more, but the last one I was working on is um, specifically about the prereqs, the requirements to get in. So oh, yeah, we're getting my, there. Yeah, so I figured we were going to get there and then I was going to find the link for exactly where it has it on the website. Perfect. So that people can kind of uh, go to that. Um, how many applications do we have in a year? Well, that all depends. Like, yeah, it really ranges. It ranges, but we tend to get hover around like sixty. So it's not yeah. an intense amount, um, and we accept about twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Yeah, but we have been on an upward trajectory of more and more. Mm -hmm. So we're not quite sure what we're what we're going to get. That's about the how much we get. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the uh, demographic, I'll, I'll take those questions and kind of maybe share it now. So um, yeah. the breakdown of the program around race, age, um, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, we have definitely marketed and kind of really tried to expand ourselves. Um, uh, when it comes to, I, I would say it's definitely a lot more diverse than I, I'm, I was a student and I graduated in 2009, um, and I've seen a significant change. Um, I would say gender tends to be the one where we're lacking. Um, mm -hmm. We tend to have, I don't know, one or two um, male identified client uh, students um, in a cohort of 20. Um, and H is pretty big range as well um, from new, you know, new grads to um, people who kind of are in second careers, sometimes third careers. So yeah, um, I think our youngest student currently is 23 and our oldest student is 65. Yeah, no. And that's um, usually been the case throughout, I would say. Yeah, right? we got quite a which is kind of nice. It's quite an array of, of experience. Yeah. But I'd say over a, a large majority of the students currently identify as non-white or mixed background when yeah. race and ethnicity, um, which wasn't the case as you were saying, Maru. It was like, and the faculty too. Like, if you looked at the faculty from just like six years ago, it was mostly like white women. But I think we're, you know, as the field's expanding and growing, um, a lot more diverse voices are are entering and needed because it's sort of really lovely to see that reflected back and. Um, so we're, it's something that we've been really trying to emphasize and to, um, yeah, make an effort to reach out. Yeah. Okay. So admissions requirements, let's see. 
So there are prerequisites. These prerequisites do not need to be completed by the time you submit your application. They need to be completed by the time you start the program in end of August. So if you are in the process of taking courses or have a plan for taking the courses, you will indicate that on the on a checklist that's part of the application process that Maru will send a link to the, our website, which you can see where it says prerequisite checklist, which is a required list, just goes through where you fill in the prerequisites. If you're missing any prerequisites, you just say, I'm planning on attending this at LA City College from this date to this date. So you don't have to have that completed in that way. You just have to have a plan of completion. If it seems like, you don't have any prerequisites and it's kind of going to be impossible for you to get you know in, in at that time then we might have you know some concerns but if you have a plan it usually isn't going to hinder your the way we're um, viewing you know your application so a minimum of 18 semester hour credits or 27 quarter hour credits in studio art also if you have worked um, in a non, like an institution that's not accredited or worked with an artist or worked in another studio or open studios, if you have a letter written with the amount of hours that you were in the studio by that agency or by that person or by that studio, for the art requirements, it does not need to be from an accredited institution. If you had a, tu a you know, if you were um, just tutoring or under someone's tutelage or anything like that, we can count those hours of art making. And you, you can talk to us more about how to, you know, if you have questions about that. The prerequisites in psychology are um, need to be from an accredited institution, a minimum of 12 semester hour credits or 18 quarter hour credits, and they have to include a developmental, which is, includes child, adolescent, or lifespan, and an abnormal. The other ones must, can, can, the other units can be from whatever you'd like. If they're really old units, it might flag, because if you took them in 1976, we might be like, oh, okay, that might not be the most up to date. So it would, might require uh, looking at the syllabus to make sure those some topics were covered for the site courses. So the site courses within the last five years are pretty good, last 10 years, you know. So just if you have any questions about that, I can look, I can look it over and do a review. We just wanna make sure that you're coming in with the, like the most updated information so you don't feel kind of behind because um, we want everyone to start with the same kind of base knowledge so we can build on it. Um, a bachelor's degree is required because it is a master's program. We are not re we are not requiring te the tests. We used to require that you either take an, uh, the GRE or the Miller's Analogies test. But because of access issues related to the pandemic, we are re recommending if you'd like to. And so for some people, let's say your grades don't really reflect the kind of like passion and drive you have because you might've taken it a while ago or life circumstances might've happened in a moment where you're like, I was caring about other things besides school. Sometimes taking um, the Miller's Analogies test or the GRE can help sort of like balance that kind of academic part of your portfolio, but we're not requiring it for this cycle. Um, two letters of recommendation to relevant to either professional volunteer or mental health experience. Again, you don't have to have experience working in the mental health field, but somebody you feel like can maybe attest to some qualities or characteristics that you think are helpful in a clinician or, um, or about your personality or um, that might be an asset. Autobiography, so 10 to 12 pages with emphasis on pivotal personal life experiences that reference uh, psychological understanding. So basically what that means is why are you choosing to be an art therapist? What led you there? So what are the pivotal life moments where you're like, this kind of led me to this path of understanding this was the career for me. And we're looking for like self-reflection that you're able to have like some insights into yourself and into, uh, yeah, just kind of like a psychological understanding. We also would like a portfolio of up to 10 images. Um, and there's going to be a statement on one of the images and that'll be prompted as part of the application process. Again, in the statement is don't uh, choose an image that just is like the prettiest, like, oh, look at this, I painted this eye very well, but one that has meaning to you because we want to, again, hear about your relationship to the art making. So we're not really looking necessarily at like, if we think your art is quote unquote good, we're looking at your engagement with it. And we do look, variety is helpful. So some people who are like have one medium, we're kind of concerned like, oh, are they going to be flexible enough to work with other materials if it's warranted for the client's needs. Because we wanna make sure that we're helping the client use the materials that best access whatever uh, interventions we're trying to help. And so a variety is good. Even if you're just doing something, it doesn't have to be done from in a, a class, but just kind of that helps. So if you're a photographer, do a little, do some paint and see what happens, make a little sculpture, um, and then just kind of round out that portfolio.
as part of the application. Can I, I want to stop you there for a second because there's a bunch of questions about kind of just some of the, um, the portfolio. Got it. Um, and so some of it is, um, and just to clarify, it's uh, 10 different pieces of artwork, not 10 images of the same artwork and I different mean, angles. Could, you, Unless, well. You could do it that way, but I think we'd be like, <laughs> I mean, I love what I'm seeing, but yeah, it's 10 works would be great. So, yeah. but, so you know, 10 but up pieces. to 10 images. So if you feel like one really needs to be front and back, like. Yeah, and, and all <laughs> angles, 10, 10. Fine. But just 10 images, work. but you want to show variety. So yeah. use, think about like, you're like, you need to see the back of this one. You know, you can split screen it, but it just like show, just to show variety, however that looks to you. Yeah. And then something that I wanted to kind of bring to your attention to see what, what you think versus um, just my own right responses. Um, they're asking a lot about now that we are not um, requiring right the yeah. testing, you know, how recommended is it? Does it help the application process if they do take it? And then someone asked a great question, which is, is it going to hurt them if they do take it? And it's not that great. And just I would say, I'll in. answer that one. Don't give it to us. If yeah, it was don't terrible. turn it in. Just burn the paper. <laughs> yeah, um, just don't. <laughs> but don't submit but, it. Yeah, but the idea is like, um, you're, so we're we're trying to get a sense of you, and so it's really hard to make recommendations because we want to see who you are, and so we want the choices to be made made on like this represents me, and if you feel like. Oh, I did not. And again, each of these can balance different parts of you, right? So we're looking for academic. We're also looking for like, a, you know, sort of an ethics and uh, a commitment to social justice. We're looking for like the kind of qualities that will make uh, a good th therapist, right? And so if you feel like, mm, I don't really have a lot of evidence of my academic ability because of just circumstances, then it might be a good idea to either get a letter of recommendation that can talk and uh, talk to some of your skills, take the GRE or the MAT, or contextualizing your autobiography. So it really is about what it's like to what it needs to balance your portfolio. If you feel like you have a strong academic transcript and everything else is pretty strong, then you probably don't need to take the, the test at all. You know, so it's really hard to say, should you do it or not? Because it really depends on the balance of your space, but just make sure you contextualize. So if your grades aren't so great, we under like, you know, it, it's not, we understand that like things happen. So make sure you just address it in your autobiography or, and try to find a way to contextualize in other spaces. If you're not good at test taking, and that was part of the reason why you didn't succeed so well in institutions, don't take another test. You know, just like say, I'm really bad at test taking. And I gravitated toward art because it was the way I can express myself without feeling limited by these sort of like, you know, structures. So contextualize it in some place. You know, that's so I, that's the best I can I can say. And another really good question about the art is can a creative writing piece count? Yeah, I mean, but you I would, would make it count, right? Yeah, I, of think course. It, I think but you have to be able to present it in a way. I mean, I think we right? want to get a More. sense of you and who you are. So if you feel like, hey, this really helps, but we are training you to use symbol, symbolism, imagery, yeah. and metaphor more in a visual sphere. Yeah. So if it's all kind of just creative writing, but we, but, but that's part of like, if you look at contemporary art practice, like I'm a performance artist, so I bring in a lot of performative work with my clients. So it, art is all very expansive, but again, just think of variety um, so if you feel like, hey, this is a really good thing, I think people are going to really understand me from this, like pop it in, but just make sure that you also have other representation of different kinds of visual art mediums. Any other questions, Maru, that you think would be helpful to? Yeah, I think the, the filmmaker, Nicole, um, right, I think it applies to the same as the creative. So I think you can 100%, right, like submit um, a video submission from what I um, yeah, video submissions are again like video art, performance art, yeah. all that you know is art. And so, if you made a film and you're like, want to see my film? Sure. And if it can't upload, just put a link, put a link in the sort of uh, mm -hmm. space. Um, another good question, and I actually don't know the answer to this one, so I'll be learning too. Is does um, kind of uh, for the professional letter of rec? Mm -hmm. um, would a non mental health related field like hurt or is it more specific to maybe just getting to know the applicant or yeah, is I mean, it I recommended think... to have something in the mental health field. I mean if you got something in the mental health field that talks about how great you are working in the mental health field score, yeah. but not everyone has that. 
Yeah. And so we're really looking for just someone who can, uh, who it's helpful if they know you better than like, so if you feel like, oh, this person barely knows my name, but they work in a field that's really good, is not as strong as someone who can really speak to your character and your work ethic or your passions or, right? The letters of recommendations are someone who you feel like will really understand and be able to say like, I understand why this person would want to go into this field because I've seen them do this kind of stuff or work mm -hmm. or the way they in interact with people, the way they sort of like volunteer, the way they do this. Um, that's what we're kind of looking for is someone who can like really support you in this journey, oh. and if, you know, and so... And to answer another question on this note is the letter of recommendation should ideally be from someone who has seen you right work. It can't be just from, um, you know, your parents. Well, you can have, you know, if you feel like there's well, a, you can have your parents. A, well, you right? can. I'm not saying it's a great idea, but I'm saying <laughs> like there are sometimes. Well, I'm trying to help them out. <laughs> yeah, I'm through. I'm saying like we. It's about people who you feel like can really talk about, you know, and it's helpful if they see, if they have seen you in some sort of context, yeah. like a, a professor, a, a boss, a yeah. mentor, uh, individuals like that. But some people have written really amazing letters, like a family friend who likes known them for their whole life and can talk about their experience. Right. But again, it's like we um, as we're looking at this balance of it, we're kind of thinking like, oh, well, were there no other why why did you choose that person you know and we are wanting to make sure that people also know what they're getting into and so if they have no experience have never been to therapy never really volunteered or never really thought you know we want to kind of understand like how we want to make sure this makes sense for you um yeah but so if you have more specific questions like i'll be happy to you know answer them via email but i'm going to move on for now and then we can go back to some of the questions but these are all good so there's going to be an online interview um, where you're going to answer just some questions that are going to come up. It's not really an interview, I guess. It's more of like a recording where you'll be prompted with some questions that um, you'll just answer. You can kind of re-record it a, another time too. So, you know, you have a little a moment to kind of collect yourself, respond. If you don't like what you did, there's a re-recording option. And then we kind of look at that. And then the prerequisite checklist. So the online application is under the College of Communication and Fine Arts. So please make that selection. Remember we're in the College of Communication and Fine Arts because there's other sort of counseling degrees, but we're the one that's under the CFA. You're gonna select Masters of Arts in Marital Family Therapy with specialization in art therapy. And it's really helpful if you have all that information ready to go, but you can go back to the application again uh, the, and input information, You know, go back and forth through it. And the application should be completed by or on uh, by or before November 2nd, 2021. So next month, right? We're in October. Okay. It's been a long one. Okay. So, well, the other thing that you will to kind of know is that there'll be either an on campus or virtual group interview. So on February 6th or 7th, we, um, once you've kind of made it to round two, so there's kind of two rounds of admissions. The first round is we look at the applications that come in, we look at your recorded interview, we look at the portfolio, we look at all that stuff, we make a determination of the candidates that we'd like to interview, and you're interviewed in a group, and we just kind of make art together and talk about what we're thinking and where, why we're here. You'll have a one-on-one -on -one interview with somebody as well to answer any particular questions you might have or anything else that maybe we need more contextualization for from your application. And then by the beginning of March, you should know if you've been admitted or accepted into the program. Anthony, did our slide say November 2nd? No, November 22nd. Okay, because I think there was some confusion there, and I want to make sure everyone knows it's it is November, not November 22nd. 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 Yeah, because that November. would be like in two weeks. So. No, yeah, November 22nd. Okay. Um, so financial aid. The thing is, I've forgotten how uh, I was one of the things I forgot to do is figure out how much per unit it is. So it's a 60 unit program and I know the units are a thousand something, something. So it's not, it's not. I'll, I'll look it up right now. See if I can you. get it. Yeah. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, but it, we, there is financial aid opportunities. Most people go through. Uh, and also if you can, um, Maru type in Jennifer Bond's email or yeah, email into the chat. Um, in charge of like financial aid. Most students do FAFSA, that's what I did. I was able to pay off my student loans, so I am free of them. Um, but there are loan forgiveness programs that if you work in community mental health, 
there's a lot of stipends and other opportunities. But again, this is all depends on the economy and what's being valued at the time. So if mental health services are being valued and there's support for them or not, there are internal scholarships and departmental awards that you can apply to when you get into the program. But there's also other grants and scholarships available through the uh, Art Therapy Association, Marital Family Therapy, and I'll show you those links in a moment. So yeah, Maru will tell us exactly how expensive it is now. But again, uh, oh, wait, oh, I saw it over there. Tuition rate is 1,385 per unit, but that might be last year's rate. So it's around. I haven't found it yet because I yeah. got distracted by, and there's Jennifer Bond's email, which I did not have. So um, let me put that on the chat to have everyone kind of. And so um, if you have questions about that, I'm also happy to respond. Like a lot of people, again, do FAFSA and then have either paid off their loans or I know a few who've gotten mm -hmm. loan forgiveness. Also, sometimes there's places that will, um, that we've, our students have been high recipients of scholarships and awards. Like we've yeah. sort of dominated a lot of um, sort of scholarships and awards that are given to new, uh, students who've just graduated. If they make a commitment to public mental health up to $20,000 to $40,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can speak to my own experience too because um, and I don't know if Anthony you know about the practicum sites uh, giving stipends, but I was Spanish speaker and I did get a stipend, which I think was rare, and I don't know if it's more common now. Um, but there was a, a I mean it wasn't you know, much, but you know there was a stipend, um, and I also did the um, student, um, uh, forgiveness, uh, well, it was in student forgiveness, but after I graduated, I worked for a few years in which I would get, um, $10,000 per year for working that would go straight to my student loans for working with, um, a particular population that was in, in need. Um, so those are some really, um, Good opportunities there. And do you know, Anthony, if we have any sites right now that offer? We do have um, sites that offer stipends as well. In fact, the Helen B. Lingard um, Clinic, we have stipends that go there. Right. So they're competitive kind of places where you send in an application to, to get them. And there are scholarships and stipends that come from our clinic, as well as other agencies as well. But this is just like the wheel of where what where funding goes. You know, that's what's so hard about the field sometimes is like people put money towards it and then they pull it away. So it's hard to know, but um, again, there's a lot of opportunities um, to seek either that or again, stipends, scholarships, financial aid. There's a lot of support on campus. Uh, it's just, you know, if you're paying a lot, so take advantage of it. It's a private institution. That's why you have a practicum coordinator. There's a lot of things on, on main campus, we call it, because graduate programs are in University Hall, which is sort of a little bit, a little further away, but it's a nice walk to main campus. We have Academic Resource Center um, to help, especially they have uh, great tutorials on how to get back into grad school, how to like how to like prioritize reading and homework and helping with proofreading papers. We have our own liaison for our, specifically for our department, Alexander Justice, who helps with like any library and research. We have a graduate student association. We have our own um, art therapy student association. There's career development students. And we have a lot of affinity groups that you can be a part of to help sort of like with kind of campus support climate um, and a lot of other places to engage. So these are the professional organizations. Uh, let's see if I, yeah. So we have the American Art Therapy Association. That is sort of who governs sort of like our field. We have the Southern California Art Therapy Association, which is the subdivision of ADA that is more localized, a local chapter. And then we have the California Association of Marital and Family Therapy. I recommend going on these websites, Maru, if you wouldn't mind typing them in, going on the websites and just like looking around, seeing what's going on, um, as well as, you know, the American Art Therapy Association is having like a, their symposium or their, what was it called? It's not called a symposium. Maru, what's it called? The conference? The conference, that's the word. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> something like that. Um, they're having a conference right now, all virtual, but this is a good place yeah. for scholarships and other opportunities to engage or understand more. So camped SoCal ADA and arttherapy.org. I recommend looking, looking into those. 
So employment, so 2020 graduates, 98% have are employed. Some of them have, oops, follow us. Some of us have, um, so uh, it was kind of a wild time, you know, and so a lot of individuals who had, actually couldn't seek employment because they had to take care of children at home. So with the, again, the tr transition of everything shutting down and children not being able to go to school. So a lot of pe people did not delay their employment search. We did a poll of the recent graduates. Um, at nine out of 12 were employed when we at last asked them. Two were not looking and six didn't respond to us. They're busy. Um, so tradition, within a year, we've had most of our students have found work. Right now, the majority of students are actually not looking for work because I think of just everything going on with the pandemic and I think they're kind of trying to reconfigure. So our, our data is a little, a little off um, for now, but we're probably going to do another poll in a few and see if those other people who are looking have found work. But um, a lot of people did, like were really exhausted with the telehealth, decided to take some time off. I must say, though, that this field is uh, needed. Yeah. <laughs> right? I think that that's one thing that did happen throughout the pandemic was it highlighted the necessity mm -hmm. and it lowered a lot of the stigma. Right. So in well, some ways, and we try to place you in practicums that traditionally have hired our students. I was hired right out of school in the practicum I was placed in my second year. And we try, we don't, you know, the university is always like get more students, enroll more students. And we're like, we don't want to take in more students that we feel comfortable we can actually place in work settings. Um, and making sure that we're limiting um, what we think would be given, giving you a the, the most, um, the best education for what you're paying for that individual small class sizes, for the sort of cohort group experience, and to make sure that we're preparing you and putting you into a field in which we know you can seek and get employment. So um, yeah, so we're confident in that way. Yeah, And I know a lot of you have to go, we're a little past our time, but um, definitely, you know, reach out to us if you have any other questions. Both of our emails are there. Um, we have Jennifer's email for more financial aid. And you also have Lori that you've been in contact with. Yeah. So, And feel free to reach out. And if you have particular questions, we'll answer them. You can just do both Maru and my, myself in one email. So if one of us misses it, the other one will get it. If you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one time to chat for 10 minutes or so or 15, happy to do that. Um, we don't want there to be barriers if you're really interested in this. Um, you know, because we we just are really excited to have people interested in coming in the field and continue to grow and expand it. And we're really not interested in making one kind of art therapist, but really helping you figure out what kind of art therapist you want to be and where you would like to move the, the field forward, whether it's moving more, um, doing private practice work, which is where I think a lot of people, if you're trying to pay off your student loans, that's where you go. Because you can in right now in, in like when I'm helping people find therapists, the base salary is like 150 an hour, up to like $300 an hour for a therapeutic setting. But there's also community and mental health, our therapists who teach courses, um, our therapists who work as consultants, um, who help with education, who help with curriculum, who help with businesses. So there's a lot of different places our therapies work in very in a lot of different settings. And I think the faculty is a great representation of that in the different ways that we use the degree. Um, that kind of fit like who we are and the kind of work we want to do. So we really um, encourage you to reach out. And if you need some support or help, um, if you're not sure this is for you, like you're, it's more like, mm, I don't think that's true. I think there's room for everybody, just if you want to do it and you want to be a part of this. So just reach out. We'll be happy to talk to you more. But in the meantime, we can linger around if there's any particular questions. I'm going to stop the recording. And then um, if there's any questions you have, I have about like, you know, five, 10 more minutes. So thank you very much for coming and joining us. And Maru, I know you have I to do, go. I do unfortunately have to go because right. talking about childcare, they're gonna oh. call me if I don't get the child. Yeah, you so go pick up your child. I'm gonna go do that, but and it I'm, was really wonderful to see all, all, uh, all of you here and please reach out if you have any questions, okay? Right. Hope to Maru. see you, see you some next fall maybe. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to stop the recording.